This is a Scream Queen production. I'm Jen Carpenter, and this is So Dead Podcast. Deadheads, hello. Happy True Crime Tuesday. Happy Taco Tuesday. All that good stuff. I hope this episode finds you all safe and sane. The world is still (laughs) terrifying out there, and that takes its toll on one's mental health. Um, It brings to mind a saying that goes, be kinder than necessary because everyone you meet is fighting some kind of battle. And while that's true all the time, you never know what someone else is going through. It's a little unique right now because we're kind of all fighting the same battle at the moment, which is the fucking coronavirus, and we're all handling it in different ways. But just, you know, assume that the person that's standing next to you in line from six feet away or taking your order with a mask on is also stressed. They're also a human. Their shitty attitude or whatever you you think that you see, that might have nothing to do with you. And in fact, it probably doesn't. Um, You know, we see people the way that we want to see them. So... You see someone that just seems not that pleasant, has the whole resting bitch face, which guilty over here. I have to remind myself to relax and smile so I don't look like I'm plotting a murder at all times. (laughs) Um, You know, that's got nothing to do with you. It's very possible that I'm trying to remember the name of the killer covered in my story next week or remember if I finished a task and I just might be looking in your direction not actually shooting you a death glare and that opposite's true you know that person that's super friendly super outgoing they could be overcompensating for the fact that they've got a body in the basement you just never know in fact psychopaths are notorious charmers there are snakes everywhere And you got to be careful. You just never know. Case in point, it might not surprise you guys at all to hear that I have always been a neurotic worrier. I had anxiety before I even knew what anxiety was. Both of my kids were born at the same hospital in Lansing. Uh, At the time, it was called Ingham Medical. I have no idea what it's called now. These hospitals around here change names so many times. But both times, more so the first time, but still both times, I was super paranoid that someone was going to steal my baby. Now, to be fair, they were fucking adorable, both of them. But um, I was just, I was sure someone was going to take them if I took my eyes off them or that the hospital would make a mistake and switch my baby with another baby. I was just sure that something was going to go wrong and I would not let either one of them out of my sight the entire time that we were in the hospital. At the tender age of 18, I'd already watched way too many made-for-TV movies and true crime documentaries to trust strangers with my precious, defenseless little newborns. And yet, despite my hypervigilance, both of my sons were kidnapped at birth. <laughs> Sorry. I had to do it. I had to do it. Wouldn't that be, like, wouldn't that be just quite the twist that I was hiding something like that from you all? No. It's, that's not true. None of that's true. But it is possible that I let a convicted murderer near my children when they were just hours old. That the kind elderly woman who changed my sheets and brought me fresh towels was once the topic of dinner tables around the country. The subject of dozens of movies and songs and books that we all know and love. We're talking Brad Pitt movies and Springsteen songs here. Did I say Springsteen? Might have. Springsteen, the boss. So, major business. What's more, I actually lived directly behind that hospital for several years when my kids were little. So, this woman, who had been accused of some of the most heinous crimes in American history, was essentially working in my backyard, where my children played, learned to ride their bikes, went trick-or-treating... I didn't know this at the time, or I would have flipped out probably, but today we're going to talk about the crimes of that unassuming little old lady, which actually took place on the other side of the country. Now, 
The last time I covered a case that involved both Michigan and Nebraska, it was a wild ride. You guys remember the Liz Gallier case, right? That crazy love triangle from Plenty of Fish with all the weird stalking? Well, this one's equally wild, so buckle up once again, buttercups, because today we're talking about the Starkweather murders. Carol Ann Fugate, can't, okay, just, we'll get it out of the way now. Her name is Carol Ann, and all I hear in my head when I say it is the little weird lady from the Poltergeist movies. Carol Ann, come into the light, Carol Ann. I loved that lady. I loved those movies. We should talk about those someday. Some weird fucking shit went on there. Anyway, let's start over. Carol Ann Fugate was born in Lincoln, Nebraska on July 30th, 1943 to Bill and Belda Fugate. She had a sister, Barb, who was three years her senior. The Fugates had it pretty rough. They were very poor. Bill was an abusive alcoholic who was always in and out of work, which coincided with him being in and out of jail. They were constantly getting evicted from homes and apartments because they couldn't make rent. The girls never had toys or new clothes. Just a bad situation all around. If there was a saving grace, it was Velda. Carol Ann and Barb's mom was devoutly religious and fiercely protective of her daughters. When Bill came home at the end of each day, Velda and the girls had a routine. The girls would run and hide in the closet. If Bill was sober, Velda would call them out and all was well they'd go about their evening. Because Bill was a great dad when he was sober. But if he was drunk, the girls would remain in the closet until he passed out so that Velda was the sole target of his rage. This went on until the Fugates moved into a tenement house in Lincoln, where Velda's mother, Pansy Street, also lived. We're going to pause to talk about that amazing name, Pansy Street. (laughs) I love it so much, and I don't know why. A tenement house is basically either a really big house or a building that was used for some other purpose that has kind of been sectioned off into smaller apartments. So it's not an apartment building per se, but a bigger house that's been turned into an apartment building, kind of, if that makes sense. One day, Bill came home rip-roaring drunk. While Barb and Carol Ann hid in the closet, they listened as their father began to beat and choke their mother. They were scared enough for their mother's life that they felt the need to help, so usually they stayed in the closet no matter what happened, but this time they they were scared, and so they came flying out of the closet, and they found Bill with his hands wrapped tightly around Velda's neck, choking her. Barb grabbed a knife and tried to stab her father, while Carol Ann took a hammer, got down on the floor, and started smashing his toes. During this family fight to the death, Pansy arrived and broke things up. Bill Fugate left his family for good that day. Carol Ann was only eight years old. A few years later, Velda began dating a man from work, World War II veteran Miriam Bartlett, who was 20 years her senior. He was good to Velda and the girls, though. Um, He was pretty strict, and he expected the girls to follow rules, which they weren't really used to, so they had... They had a bit of an adjustment period, but he, he was genuine. His motives were genuine, and he genuinely... Did I just say genuine enough? My God, he was genuine. Did you guys get that? Um, he loved the girls, and to them, he, they weren't his stepdaughters. He always just referred to them as his daughters. Marion and Velda got married, and in 1955, when Barb was 14 and Carol Ann was 11, their mother gave birth to her third daughter, Betty Jean, who the family referred to as Miss Bartlett. The girls were over the moon for their little sister. She was like their very own doll. They were always dressing her up and making toys for her and doing her hair. They just loved, loved, loved their baby sister. Soon after Betty Jean was born, the family of five moved out of the tenement house and into a three-room house located at 924 Belmont Street in Lincoln. Not a three-bedroom house, a three-room house. There was one bedroom, a living room, and a kitchen. No bathroom, but there was an outhouse. That's just crazy to me. This is like the mid to late 1950s. I can't even... Outhouses? Gross. Barb and Carol Ann shared the bedroom, while Velda, Marion, and baby Betty Jean used the living room as their bedroom. 
Over the next couple of years, Marion added on a master bedroom, a dining room, and a real bathroom. Hallelujah. You can't live in a house with four females and expect them to only have an outhouse. That's just not a not a thing. Velda had a garden and she did a lot of canning. They had chickens and ducks and they sold eggs and meat to the neighbors to make money. Just like a quiet little home steady existence, which honestly, that has kind of become my dream throughout this pandemic. That's why I've got all these chickens and bunnies and all kinds of crazy stuff going on over here now. But we're not talking about me. We're talking about the Bartlett's. So just a quiet, quiet little life. But things wouldn't stay quiet for long. Now things are about to get real confusing because apparently in the 1950s everyone's names were Bob, Carol, and Barb. Like everyone. But I'm gonna do my best to help you guys keep this all straight and help myself keep it straight. It's, it's a lot. All right. When she was 16, Carol Ann's sister Barb began hanging out with a girl from school whose name was also Barb. We'll call her Barbara for the sake of clarity. Barbara was dating a boy named Rodney Starkweather. Rodney and Barbara introduced Barb to Rodney's younger brother, Charlie. Barb and Charlie started dating, but Barb was much more drawn to Charlie's best friend, Bob Von Busch. These names are crazy. Bob Von Busch and Barb were worried about how Charlie was going to react when he found out that they had been running around behind his back and wanted to be together, obviously. Uh, So to take the sting out of it a bit, they decided to introduce Charlie to Barb's little sister, Carol Ann, in hopes that they would hit it off. Now, the big problem here was Barb and Barbara and Bob and Rodney and Charlie These kids are all 17, 18, 19 years old in that range. And Carol Ann was 13. She was in the seventh grade when she was set up on her first date with 18-year-old Charlie Starkweather. And that's uh, illegal. Um, Illegal, guys. And gross. But Charlie and Carol Ann hit it off instantly and everyone was happy about it. Well, not everyone, but we'll get to that in a little bit. First, I want to talk to you guys about Charlie Starkweather. Charles Raymond Starkweather was born on November 4, 1938 in Lincoln, Nebraska. He was the third of seven children born to Guy, a carpenter, and Helen, a waitress. Unlike Carol Ann, who had a rough childhood, Charlie's was pretty good. The Starkweathers didn't have a lot of money, but they were well-respected in the community. Guy and Helen had a loving relationship and were good to the kids, All of the Starkweather children loved their father, who took them to the zoo on the weekends. When your family's that big, you kind of live in a bubble. And little Charlie, who had bright red hair and big green eyes, he was happy in his bubble. But, as we all know, every bubble must burst. And for Charlie, that happened on his first day of school. Charlie was born with a condition that left his legs deformed, and he had a pretty heavy speech impediment. His clothes were worn, and it was evident just by looking at him that he didn't come from money. So on his very first day in the big wide world, the other kids in his class took to calling Charlie a bow-legged, red-headed woodpecker. (laughs) That's not funny. It's awful, but we won't have a lot of sympathy for Charlie here in a little bit, so hence the laughter. So this was the day that Charlie Starkweather decided he hated the world. Over the years, the only thing Charlie was really any good at was physical activity. He wasn't a big guy. He was actually pretty small. He was only about 5'5 as an adult, but he was strong, and he was filled with rage and jealousy. When he would see someone bigger than him, better looking than him, more well-off than him, his way of bringing them down a notch was to pick a fight and kick their ass. Kind of like a who's the big man now type of thing. And while this gave Charlie temporary satisfaction, it certainly didn't improve his station in life. Like, at all. He dropped out of high school when he was 16, and he started working at the local newspaper factory. His idol was James Dean. He went out and bought a leather jacket, started smoking cool cigarettes. Not cool like these cigarettes are cool, but the brand cool with a K. I don't know if that's still a thing I don't smoke, but it used to be. 
He started slicking his hair back in that kind of ducktail style that James Dean was famous for. He liked to drive fast cars, and he was known locally as the king of the demolition derby, for whatever that's worth. He even started a gang. The gang uniform was blue jeans, cowboy boots, and leather jackets. And you will never guess what their name was. The Leather Jackets. (laughs) Even better... Their rival gang in town was called the Levi Jackets. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm serious. That's not a joke. The the Leather Jackets and the Levi Jackets were the rival gangs in Lincoln in the 1950s. Uh, The Leather Jackets stole cars, started fights, and just kind of engaged in all sorts of petty crimes. By the time he was 18, Charlie Starkweather only loved two things— Guns and cars. Until the day he met 13-year-old 7th grader Carol Ann Fugate. He loved her too, pretty immediately, and from then on, they were always together. He taught her how to drive and how to shoot a gun, and he was always buying her gifts with what little money he made at the newspaper factory. Right up until the day that he was hurt on the job. He was hit in the head by a big metal lever on one of the machines, and was left with what today we would call a TBI. And as we all know, TBIs spell nothing but trouble in the true crime world. Carol Ann doted on Charlie as much as a 13-year-old can dote on a grown man as he recovered from his head wound, but he was never quite the same. He suffered from headaches, blurred vision, dizziness, got confused a lot. He just wasn't really himself. He lost his job at the newspaper factory, and he started working with his brother Rodney collecting trash. It was a steady job, and the Starkweather brothers had a route in one of the richest neighborhoods in Lincoln. It was the route that all of the other collectors wanted, but Charlie absolutely hated it. His hatred and jealousy of those he perceived as better than him grew more every day that he had to pick up their trash. The head wound didn't help either. Still, he made decent money, and he was able to save up to buy a car, a blue 1949 Ford that his father helped him insure. Charlie let Carol Ann drive his car often, until the day she crashed it into another car on her way home from school in the seventh grade. Because the insurance policy was in his name, Charlie's father had to pay the claim, which led to a huge fight between him and Charlie, which then led to him kicking Charlie out of the house which then led to a whole bunch of awful that not even Stephen King himself could have predicted. On Valentine's Day 1957, when Carol Ann's sister Barb was just 16, she married her boyfriend and Charlie's best friend, Bob Von Busch. Bob and Barb Von Busch. (laughs) Charlie's brother Rodney married Barb's best friend Barbara around the same time. Bob and Barb moved into the tenement house that the Fugates had lived in years earlier that Grandma Pansy still lived in. A few months after the wedding, just before she turned 17, Barb announced to her family that she was pregnant. So when Charlie got kicked out of his parents' house, he stayed with Bob and Barb until another room opened up in the tenement house, and he rented that. So Carol Ann's circle of friends, her sister and Bob, Barbara and Rodney, her own boyfriend Charlie— They were all living on their own, getting married, having babies. Meanwhile, Carol Ann celebrated her 14th birthday in the summer of 1957 and started 8th grade a few weeks later. She was finally starting to take school seriously, and she wanted to study to be a nurse. It was at this point, after several months of allowing the entirely inappropriate relationship between Carol Ann and Charlie, that Carol Ann's parents finally decided to step in and say something. They already had one teenage daughter married and pregnant, and they didn't want another. So Carol Ann's relationship with Charlie became a point of contention in the Fugate Bartlett home, with her parents pushing her to break up with Charlie and, you know, play with dolls. Because she was 14. 14. Meanwhile, Charlie could feel Carol Ann pulling away, and he started to get desperate. He was spending all of his money buying her gifts, trying to make her happy. So much of his money... But he couldn't pay his rent, and he wound up getting locked out of his room at the tenement house. So he started sleeping in his car. He often parked at the Crest service station overnight, which was a 24-hour gas station and convenience store just a couple blocks from Carol Ann's house. Charlie became friends, sort of, 
with the night clerk Robert McClung. Robert would float Charlie money for soda and cigarettes, give him a couple bucks here and there, and in return, Charlie would sometimes help Robert when the station got busy, cleaning windshields and that kind of stuff. Robert left Crest in the fall of 1957, and he was replaced by another Robert. Bobs. All Bobs. Everybody's a Bob. Robert Bobby Colbert was a 21-year-old expectant father who'd recently been discharged from the Navy. He didn't take pity on Charlie Starkweather the way his predecessor did, and he didn't like having him around all night. On November 30th, 1957, about a month after Bobby Colbert started working the night shift at Crest, Charlie Starkweather arrived sometime between 11 and midnight. He went into the store, and while he was looking around, he saw a stuffed animal that he thought Carol Ann would like, but he didn't have enough money to buy it. He asked Bobby to allow him to purchase it on credit, and Bobby refused. Charlie left the store angry, but he returned several times. I mean, where's he going to go? He lives in the parking lot. So he keeps returning, and he's trying to reason and bargain with Bobby over this gas station stuffed animal that's supposed to save his relationship with a 14-year-old girl. That's where we are in this, in this story right now. According to Charlie, Bobby looked at him like he was trash, talked to him like he was trash, and Charlie was tired of people acting like they were better than him. So the final time he returned to the gas station, he took a firearm in with him. He grabbed the stuffed animal for Carol Ann and some snacks, then ordered Bobby to open the safe. As a new employee, Bobby didn't have the combination, so Charlie took what was in the register instead, about $160. Then, instead of fleeing with his ill-gotten gains, he forced Bobby to leave with him. He was enjoying the forced respect that Bobby Colvert was now showing him now that he had a gun in his face. Charlie forced Bobby behind the wheel of the car, then made him drive out to a secluded area a few miles from the station. Bobby parked the car on a gravel road and was ordered out of the vehicle at gunpoint. He knew Charlie was going to shoot him, so he went for the gun. The two men fought. Charlie won. He shot Bobby Colbert in the back of the head at close range, killing him instantly. Bobby Colbert left behind a young wife, and a daughter, Barbara, who was born five months after his death. At just 19 years old, Charlie Starkweather had committed his first murder, but it wouldn't be his last. Exactly a month later, on December 30th, 1957, Carol Ann's sister Barb gave birth to the first of six children, a boy she named Bobby. (laughs) I'm telling you, everyone's a Bob or a Carol or a Barb in this story. Watching Barb become a mother at 17 was a wake-up call of sorts for her parents, Uh, and they began insisting at that point that Carol Ann end her relationship with Charlie so that she didn't end up like her sister. On January 19, 1958, Carol Ann was helping Velda with the evening dishes when Charlie showed up unannounced. Carol Ann had decided to do as her parents asked and break up with Charlie, which of course led to him accusing her of cheating of him. Typical, right? There can't possibly be a reason that a 14-year-old girl would not want to continue a relationship with a grown man unless she'd found someone else to date. She couldn't just, you know, have a mind of her own or, God forbid, not like him anymore. Anyway, sorry. The two fought, and Carol Ann told Charlie she never wanted to see him again. Velda overheard the argument, and she insisted that Charlie leave as she didn't want any trouble in her peaceful home. Today... Peaceful is not a word that's often associated with the Bartlett home. What happened next depends on who you ask. There's Carol Ann's version, Charlie's version, and the truth, which can be hard to parse out because the facts are based so heavily on their stories. What is undisputed is that on January 21st, 1958, two days after Velda kicked him out, Charlie Starkweather returned to the Bartlett home at 924 Belmont Street in the middle of the afternoon. His goal, he later claimed, was to convince the Bartlett's to allow him and Carol Ann to be together. An argument ensued, and Charlie murdered the entire Bartlett family. 36-year-old Velda was shot point-blank in the face, her skull crushed by the butt of Charlie's gun. Her body was dragged out behind the house and stuffed down the outhouse hole. Her 58-year-old husband, Marion, was shot in the head and stabbed before his body was stashed in the chicken coop and -and two-and-a-half-year-old Betty Jean's skull had been crushed and her throat slashed. 
her little body was placed in a cardboard box and left in the outhouse with her mother. Where Carol Ann was when her family was murdered is up for debate. She attended school that day, like she always did, and she rode the bus home with her friend Bonnie, like she always did. They said goodbye at the end of Carol Ann's driveway, and they went their separate ways. According to Carol Ann, she opened her front door and found Charlie on the other side, pointing a gun in her face. He told her that he'd taken her family hostage and was keeping them in a safe house, and that as long as she did everything he said, she would be safe and her family would be safe. Over the next several days, Carol Ann said Charlie abused her, raped her, threatened her, and left her tied up whenever he left the house. Charlie recounted that week of terror a bit differently. According to him, Carol Ann was in on the whole thing. She was in her bedroom watching TV while he killed her family. She helped him drag the bodies outside and dispose of them. And then the two lived happily as man and wife in the Bartlett home. Quick reminder here, in case I have not said it enough, Carol Ann was in the 8th grade. During the six days Charlie and Carol Ann stayed at the Bartlett home after the family was murdered, they had several visitors. Carol Ann's sister and best friend Barb stopped by with her husband Bob and their baby, Bobby. It's like a, it's like a tongue twister, I swear to God. Carol Ann met them outside and she told them to leave, that the whole family was sick with the flu. She was harsh with Barb in a way that she wasn't normally, and she told her that if she didn't leave, she was putting their mother in danger. So, that to me kind of lends credence to Carol Ann's versions of events. Why would she say that if she didn't honestly believe that her parents were still alive? Why wouldn't she just invite Barb and the family inside and kill them too? If she hated her family so much and wanted them all dead, why why that? Uh, Bob Von Bush, Barb's husband and Charlie's best friend, knew something was off. He called the police and he asked them to do a wellness check. When an officer arrived at the Bartlett home, he encountered a disheveled Carol Ann who'd attached a note to the front door that said, Stay away, everybody is sick with the flu, and was signed Miss Bartlett with the name underlined twice. That last part's important because according to Carol Ann, she signed it that way in hopes of signaling others that something was wrong. The only Miss Bartlett in the house was two-year-old Betty Jean, who obviously wasn't old enough to write notes. As the police officer stood on one side of the door, his weapon holstered, Charlie stood on the other side, pointing a shotgun directly at him. He wouldn't have had time to react or assist Carol Ann in any way before Charlie shot him dead. At least according to Carol Ann. Around 9 a.m. on January 27th, six days after the murder, Grandma Pansy visited the Bartlett home. She insisted Carol Ann allow her into the house, but Carol Ann physically blocked the door with her body and gave an ominous warning that her mother was in danger and her grandma's presence was making it worse. As Carol Ann said this, Pansy later testified, she was subtly pointing behind her and making big crazy eyes, cues that her grandmother didn't pick up on at the time. She told Carol Ann that she was getting into the house one way or another, even if she had to go to the police. So that's what she did. She took a taxi from the Bartlett home to the police station, who drove her back to the house. They found the doors locked and the house empty. Carol Ann and Charlie were gone. One of the officers climbed through the window and unlocked the door. They found nothing amiss inside, but they weren't really looking for evidence of a crime. They were just looking for the Bartlett's, so they weren't very thorough, and they didn't check the outbuildings. They basically told Pansy to mind her own business and go home and left the scene. But Carol Ann's family knew something was very wrong. Like, if the whole family had the flu and had to be quarantined, where'd they go? Where would they go? So, around 4 p.m. that day, Bob Von Bush and Rodney Starkweather, Charlie's older brother, went back to the house and made the gruesome discovery of the bodies. Authorities were called to the scene, and the hunt was on for Charlie Starkweather and Carol Ann Fugate, who were on the run in Charlie's black 1949 Ford. They didn't go far. Bennett, Nebraska is a suburb of Lincoln about 15 miles to the southeast. It's a very rural area that even today has a population of less than a thousand. In the 1950s, there were less than 400 people living in the village, and the student body of the senior class was usually less than 10 people. 10 people. One of those people living in the village was 70-year-old August Meyer, a widowed farmer who was known about town as a quiet and easygoing man. 
He was a friend of the Starkweather family. Charlie often went hunting on Mr. Meyer's land, and it was there that he taught Carol how to shoot a gun. As he pulled into the driveway of Mr. Meyer's secluded farmhouse, Charlie got the car stuck in the snow, so they had to walk the half mile up to the house. Mr. Meyer, alerted by his barking dog, met them outside. Charlie told him he'd gotten his car stuck and needed to borrow some horses to pull it out of the snow. Mr. Meyer agreed, but he said that he needed to go back in the house and get something first. Charlie followed him, and for seemingly no reason at all, he shot the old man in the back of the head. Then he ransacked the house, taking money, valuables, and even Mr. Meyer's freshly made bowl of jello. Rude. The whole time, Carol Ann was in a daze. If her version of events is to be believed, this was the first time she'd seen Charlie kill someone, even though August Meyer was actually his fifth victim. At this point, according to her, she still had no idea her family was dead, and she knew nothing about the murder at the gas station several weeks earlier. Charlie wanted to hole up at the Meyer farm for a while, the way they'd done at the Bennett house, but Carol Ann refused to stay in a house where someone had just been murdered, which, again, this kind of lends more weight to her version of events. Because why would she care if she'd just stayed in the house where her whole family had been murdered? Why would she care about staying in this house? Charlie dragged Mr. Meyer's body from the house through the snow to an outbuilding. He then hunted down and killed the old man's dog for no fucking reason. By this point, it was dark. And I I don't think I pointed this out yet, but it was winter in Nebraska. So it was freezing cold, snowy, miserable. As they were leaving the Meyer farm, Charlie got his car stuck in the driveway. Again. This time it was in the big muddy mess that he'd created when he pulled his car out the first time. He and Carol Ann couldn't get the car unstuck by themselves, so they set off on foot. They'd traveled about a mile when a car approached. Charlie flagged it down. Behind the wheel of the dark blue 1950 Ford was a handsome, athletic 17-year-old junior at Bennett High School. Would it surprise you if I told you that his name was Bob? (laughs) Of course it wouldn't, because everyone in Nebraska is named Bob. So this Bob was Bob Jensen, a fun-loving prankster who played football, worked at his father's general store, and was crazy about his high school sweetheart, Carol King. So yeah, now we add another Carol to the story as well. This Carol was 16. She was an intelligent, kind-hearted cheerleader, volleyball player, and singer. The night she crossed paths with Charlie Starkweather, she was still mourning the loss of her father, who'd passed away unexpectedly a few weeks earlier. Given that this was rural Nebraska in the 1950s, Bob Jensen thought nothing of pulling up to two teenagers walking down a country road in the middle of the night carrying shotguns. He asked if they needed help, and Charlie explained that their car had gotten stuck in the mud a ways back. Bob offered to drive them into town to a payphone, so, guns in tow, Charlie and Carol Ann got into Bob and Carol's car. Bob drove into Bennett's downtown area, which was really just, like, a few shops and businesses, but the payphone was locked up for the night. And unfortunately, Charlie's plan B was a deadly one. He pressed his twenty-two to the back of Bob's head and ordered him to drive to a nearby abandoned schoolhouse. Charlie told Bob and Carol that he was going to lock them in the cellar and take their car. He took the $4 from Bob's wallet and assured them he wouldn't hurt them, he just wanted the car. When they arrived at the school, Charlie ordered Bob and a hysterical Carol out of the car and left Carol Ann to wait for him. The three of them disappeared into the cellar. Some time passed, and then Carol Ann heard gunshots. From here, her and Charlie's stories are different again. She said he returned to the car in a trance, having just murdered Bob and Carol, victims six and seven. Charlie said that he only killed Bob, then raped Carol and left her bound but alive. Carol Ann was furious that he'd had sex with another woman, and in a jealous rage, she went into the cellar and murdered Carol. Whoever did what, the end result was the same. Bob was shot six times in the head, Carol was raped, then shot once in the head, and stabbed several times in the abdomen. After the double murder, Charlie and Carol Ann fled the scene in Bob Jensen's car and headed back toward Lincoln. Carol Ann suggested that they get rid of Bob and Carol's school books that were in the back seat. Charlie agreed, and she tossed them out the window one by one. 
She later claimed that she did this to alert officials to the fact that something had happened to the teens because their names were written in the bindings of the book. So she hoped that someone would see these books lying in the road. Obviously, at this point, people would know the kids were missing and they would figure out that they were somewhere nearby. Again, this lends support to her story that she was a hostage and that she tried a number of times in a number of ways to silently cry for help. Charlie drove for hours through Lincoln's ritzy neighborhoods near the country club, where his trash route had been. They eventually pulled over to the side of the road and fell asleep. They woke up on the morning of January 28th, parked outside a stately French provincial on 24th Street, where one of Lincoln's wealthiest citizens lived. 47-year-old C. Lauer Ward was the president of Capital Steelworks. He lived in the home with his 50-year-old wife, Clara, and their longtime housekeeper, 51-year-old Lillian Fensel. The ward's only child, 14-year-old Michael, so their child was the same age as 14-year-old Carol Ann, was away at boarding school. Mr. Ward was a man with a good sense of humor who loved to read and smoke cigars. Mrs. Ward was a gracious host and a musician who volunteered with a number of organizations around town. Lillian Fensel was the daughter of a farmer and a waitress. She was a loyal servant to the wards, and she became like family over the years. Charlie and Carol Ann watched from the street that morning, January 28th, as Mr. Ward left the house. He had a meeting in downtown Lincoln with the governor. Once his car was out of view, Charlie pulled into the driveway at the ward home. He had Clara Ward and Lillian Fensel tied up at gunpoint before Carol Ann was even inside the house. Charlie took pleasure in making Clara, whose trash he'd picked up for months, weighed on him hand and foot. She made him coffee, made him pancakes, obeyed his every command. Meanwhile, Carol Ann slept. Whether she was a hostage or a willing participant, she and Charlie had been awake and on the run for over 24 hours. To hear Charlie tell it, her day-long nap was a signal of her indifference to the situation. But according to Carol Ann, it was proof of how traumatized she was. Her body simply gave out. As she napped for hours at a time on the Davenport, which in Michigan, we, we just call it a couch. It's, it's, it's a couch. Charlie took Clara upstairs. He intended to rape the rich bitch who thought she was better than him, but he was unable to perform. In a rage, he stabbed Clara several times, then forced Carol Ann to wash off his knife and get rid of the blood smell in the bedroom. Communicating with a hysterical Lillian Fensel was difficult once Clara was dead, because Lillian was deaf, and Charlie and Carol Ann didn't know sign language. So they communicated by writing notes, which Carol Ann later flushed down the toilet. What exactly happened to Lillian is unclear, as Charlie and Carol Ann each blamed the other for her killing, but she was tied up and stabbed multiple times. After ransacking the house and taking clothes, jewelry, and other valuables, Charlie and Carol Ann sat in the dark and waited for Mr. Ward to return from work. Before he even had a chance to take his coat off, Charlie shot him dead, then stole the cash from his wallet. They then fled in Mr. Ward's black 1956 Packard. The day Charlie Starkweather claimed victims 8, 9, and 10, a grisly scene unfolded back in Bennett. Around 2 p.m., someone spotted Charlie's car at August Meyer's farm. A horde of police officers and curious onlookers surrounded the house as commands were shouted by bullhorn and several rounds of tear gas were shot into the home. But Charlie and Carol Ann were already long gone. Authorities found the home ransacked and a trail of blood leading from the house to the outbuilding where August Meyer's body was stashed. At the same time, the entire town was frantically searching for missing teens Bob Jensen and Carol King, who'd gone out on a date the night before and never returned, which was unlike them both. Now that they knew Starkweather and Fugate had brought their evil to Bennett, everyone was a whole lot more worried about the missing teenagers. Around 4 p.m., still that same day, the 28th, about a mile down the road from the Myers farm, where they were still processing the house as a crime scene, a farmer was searching the property of the abandoned school, where he thought he'd heard a vehicle speed away from the night before. He opened the cellar door, and he found the bodies of Bob Jensen and Carol King. The following day, January 29th, police raced to the home of C. Lauer Ward after a report came in that Bob Jensen's missing car was spotted at the Lauer home. Inside, their greatest fears were confirmed. 
the stark weather body count was up to 10. So now things are serious because now one of the governor's buddies has been killed. So the National Guard and the FBI got called in. A house-to-house search began for the teenage killers. Local hardware stores sold out of ammunition. Businesses were closed. Children were pulled out of school in the middle of the day. Everyone went home and locked themselves inside their homes to stay safe. (laughs) Relatable. Does that, I don't know, does that sound familiar to you guys at all as a thing to like do? Yeah? Lock yourself in your house to stay safe. Several months later, you're still there. Anyway, speeding away from Lincoln in Mr. Ward's luxury sedan, Charlie and Carol Ann were bound for Washington, where one of Charlie's older brothers lived. The residents of Lincoln were safer than they'd been all week but they didn't know it yet. As much as he loved the Packard, Charlie knew they had to get rid of it. The police would be looking for it, and a couple of grubby teenagers in a rich man's car would definitely appear to be out of place if someone spotted them. As he drove down Highway 20 through Wyoming late at night, Charlie spotted a white Buick parked along the side of the road. He pulled over behind it, then approached the car, gun in hand. Inside was 34-year-old Merle Collison, a World War II veteran and traveling shoe salesman. Just two days earlier, Merle had left his wife and their four-month-old son for a business trip. Merle had pulled over on the side of the highway to get some sleep, and what he got instead was Charlie Starkweather. Charlie ordered Merle out of the car, but like anyone woken up out of a dead sleep by a screaming teenager holding a gun... Merle was disoriented and confused, and he didn't move fast enough for Charlie, so Charlie shot him nine times through the window. That was Carol Ann's story, at least. Charlie said Carol Ann fired those fatal shots, and that she was the most trigger-happy person he'd ever seen. What happened next was a whole entire mess. Charlie ordered Carol Ann into the back seat of the Buick, as the body of Merle Collison was still in the front seat stuffed down under the dash as much as possible. Charlie attempted to start the car, but he couldn't figure out how to release the parking brake. At that very moment, local geologist Joe Sprinkle (laughs) was driving by. He saw the two cars on the side of the road, and he thought they may have had an accident, so he pulled over too. He got out of his car, and he approached the Buick. He asked if he could help, and Charlie turned to him, gun in hand, and said, Raise your hands. Help me release the emergency brake or I'll kill you. When he looked inside the car, Joe Sprinkle saw the dead man stuffed under the dash. So he reached into the car as though he was going to help with the parking brake, but grabbed the barrel of the rifle instead. He and Charlie ended up on the ground, wrestling over the gun in the middle of the road in the middle of the night, which is where a local sheriff's deputy found them just as he happened to be driving by. And then a lot of things happened all at once. Joe Sprinkle pried the gun out of Charlie's hands, and Carol Ann fled from the murder Buick toward the officer. She was screaming, save me, save me, he's going to shoot me too. He's going to kill my mother and father and little sister. As she frantically tried to explain to the officer what was happening, Charlie got back into C. Lauer Ward's stolen Packard and sped away. The ensuing police chase reached speeds upwards of 100 miles an hour. It ended when an officer shot out the back window of the Packard, sending glass flying. The glass cut Charlie behind the ear, and as blood stained his white shirt, he feared he'd been shot. So he pulled over, got out of the car, and allowed officers to take him into custody. As they cuffed him, he claimed that the only reason they took him alive was because he ran out of bullets. Otherwise, he would have gone out shooting. When the dust settled, 11 people were dead. 10 over the course of about a week. And Charles Starkweather and Carol Ann Fugate were in custody. Charlie agreed to be extradited back to Nebraska to face charges there. He was facing the death penalty either way. Both Wyoming and Nebraska are death penalty states. What he didn't know was that Wyoming's governor was a staunch opponent of the death penalty and likely would have commuted his sentence. But authorities conveniently left that part out when giving Charlie his choice. Why the fuck was he given choices? He just killed 11 people. Why does he get to choose what happens next? Know who wasn't given any choices? Carol Ann Fugate. Sedated and without a lawyer, 
The 14-year-old was forced to sign things she wasn't allowed to read and shipped between this jail and that before being admitted to a mental institution in Lincoln. By all accounts, Carolyn was hysterical, incoherent, and looked as if she'd been crying for days. She was terrified of Charles Starkweather, and she kept telling people that he was going to kill her and her family. There wasn't a person who encountered Carol during those early days that didn't 100% believe her fear and trauma. And there wasn't a single person that didn't believe her heartbroken reaction when she learned her family had been killed. Charles Starkweather was much more at peace with his predicament. He knew he was going to fry in the electric chair. He told authorities, I always wanted to be a criminal, but not this big a one. I didn't mean for it to be this bad. At first, he took all the blame for the murders. He corroborated Carol Ann's story, that he'd taken her hostage, lied about her family, and then used that as leverage to get her to do his bidding over the next several days. But the prosecutor's office in Lincoln, who was under big-time public scrutiny for bungling the case so badly, was determined to hang them both. Not like literally hanging wasn't a thing in Nebraska in the 1950s, but you know what I mean. The first trial was for the murder of 17-year-old Bob Jensen. Charlie Starkweather was found guilty on May 23, 1958, and sentenced to death by electric chair. He was 19 years old. After his conviction, Charlie turned on Carol Ann, and he was the state's star witness in her trial. He once famously said about his date with the electric chair, If I die, then Carol should be sitting on my lap. Carol Ann's trial was also only for the murder of Bob Jensen, who Charlie had already admitted to and been convicted of killing. But the pathological liar and notorious psychopath, who'd changed his story several times, testified that Carol Ann knew about the plan to kill her family, was a willing participant in his murder spree, and was responsible for the deaths of Carol King, Lillian Fensel, and Merle Collison. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here about the evidence that suggested Carol Ann was telling the truth, but there is a lot of it. I will share a couple things, though. The first is a quote that I found in the January 29th, 1958 edition of the Lincoln Star. So this is the paper that came out the day after Charlie and Carol Ann went on the run, which means it was likely given the day that the Bartlett bodies were found. It said... Lancaster County Attorney Elmer Scheel said Tuesday night that he will definitely file first-degree murder charges against both Carol Ann Fugate and Charles Starkweather. So, this was the mindset of the man that was trying this case before he even had any idea what was actually going on. He didn't even know if Carol Ann was still alive when he said this. He just had it in his mind that they were these teenage lovers on this murderous spree together, and that was that. The other thing I want to share also involves that same slimy snake, Elmer Scheel. When Carol Ann was arrested, she had a note in her pocket asking for help, that she planned to slip to someone if she had an opportunity. Which again, is evidence that might suggest that she was a hostage and she was trying to escape. Charlie even admitted that she'd tried to escape him a few times before he changed his story and made her an accomplice. Elmer Scheel was insistent that the note be placed in his custody, and then it conveniently disappeared before the trial. Carol Ann had the full support of her grandmother, Pansy Street, and her sister, Barb Baum Bush, during her trial. Even her abusive, alcoholic daddy and his new wife showed up to support her. In retrospect, Carol Ann's family believed that she had been trying to subtly warn them of the trouble she was in, and that it was their fault for not picking up on it. You think? I mean, it's not their, I'm, what happened is not their fault. What, what Charles did is not their fault. But they definitely should have picked up on those cues. On November 21st, 1958, Carol Ann Fugate was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison at the Nebraska Correctional Center for Women in York, Nebraska. The jury felt that Carol Ann had ample opportunity to escape during Charlie's reign of terror, and the fact that she didn't meant that she was a willing participant. I guess... We can forgive them a little for not recognizing that this girl had a major case of Stockholm Syndrome, as that term didn't even exist until the 70s, but what I cannot for the life of me understand is that they didn't understand that Carol Ann was a fucking 8th grader. An 8th grader. One of the clips in one of the movies that I watched made me so angry because 
the prosecutor was questioning her about her and Charlie's sex life, and he was doing it in a way that he was trying to use it as evidence that she was a willing participant. Dude, you're talking to a 14-year-old girl about her multiple rapes. This was a grown man and an eighth grader. Just, oh, oh, so infuriating. Anyway, Charles Starkweather was put to death in the electric chair on June 25th, 1959. He was the last prisoner to be executed in Nebraska until 1994, when the people demanded that the death penalty be reinstated. In 1976, Carol Ann's sentence was commuted from life to 30 to 50 years due to a Supreme Court ruling that prohibited minors from receiving life sentences. She was given credit for good behavior, and after 17 years behind bars, Carol Ann Fugate was paroled in 1976 at the age of 32. And this is where we come in, fellow Michiganders. Upon her release, Carol Ann told reporters that she wanted to live a normal life free of publicity. <laughs> it's a hard word. Free of publicity to settle down and get married and have a couple of kids. And she definitely couldn't do that in Nebraska, where everyone knew who she was. So she was allowed to go live with a couple who'd befriended her while she was in prison after watching a documentary on her case. And that couple lived in Lansing, Michigan. In 1976, four years before I was born, Carol Ann Fugate moved to my hometown. She got a job as an orderly at Ingham Medical Hospital, where she worked for over 25 years before retiring, which meant she was working there when I was there, giving birth to both of my children. I actually know a few people who worked with her, and they all said that she was very nice, but she didn't like to talk about her past, understandably, and she didn't like it when people asked her about it. She worked nights as a nanny for a local family for many years, and the children she cared for just adored her. And that's, that's the thing, that's uh, one of the things. There are so many things. Carol, by all accounts, prior to the murders, was a good girl. She loved her family. She loved her sisters. She followed the rules. She had a potty mouth and a little bit of a wild streak, but she was a good girl. And then after, she was a model prisoner. She helped take care of sick prisoners. She ran Bible study groups. So before the murders and after the murders, she was this wonderful person. But for this one span of a week and a half, she turned into a cold-blooded murderer? I don't buy it. Like it all. Carol Ann never had children of her own, but she did eventually get married. In 2007, at the age of 64, she married Frederick Clare, a widower she met at Soaring Eagle Casino in Mount Pleasant, which, if you're from Michigan, I know you're familiar with. I've lost some money there myself. Gambling is not for me. I am not a lucky person. I have to work real hard for all the good things I have. I don't just get... I don't just get like, pull that lever and you've got 10 grand. I, I have to fight for like every dollar. Anyway, Carol Ann was very honest with Frederick about her past and he didn't care. I mean, I'm, I'm sure he cared a little, but he loved her and he wanted to marry her anyway. Her first meeting with his kids was a bit awkward though. Um, he had four adult sons when he and Carol got engaged and his son Tom was a bit of a true crime buff. Uh, a murderino, if you will. And he'd read a book about the Starkweather murders. He even recognized Carol Ann when he met her, but he couldn't place her face. When she told him her name, he said, Holy cow, are you from Nebraska? You're Carol Fugate. The one from the murders. <laughs> the one from the murders. That's just, I can't even. Blended families are awkward and tricky, but that, yeah. Um, so while Carol's new family welcomed her with open arms, happiness was not to be. On August 5th, 2013, she and Frederick were on their way to Firekeeper's Casino in Battle Creek when Frederick lost control of their Ford Explorer on I-69 and rolled into the median. He was killed instantly. 70-year-old Carol was so badly injured she was believed to be dead at first. Her body was crushed and broken in multiple places, and she spent several months in the ICU. But she pulled through. 
She now lives in Hillsdale, Michigan, a smallish town south of Jackson. Earlier this year, in February 2020, just before the Rona hit, 76-year-old Carol Ann requested a pardon from the state of Nebraska. In her request, she wrote, The idea that posterity has been made to believe that I willingly participated in a murder spree is too much for me to bear. So it wasn't about, you know, less time or expunging her record. It was about absolution. It was about her being able to say, look, the courts finally admitted that I didn't do this. Her request had lots of support. A former prison warden, her four stepsons, the family she worked for as a nanny for 14 years, and even the granddaughter of C. Lauer and Clara Ward, two of the Starkweather victims. Liza Ward is the daughter of the Ward's only child, Michael, who was 14, the same age as Carol Ann at the time of the murder. She had done an extensive amount of research on the murders, and she is confident that Carol Ann was as much a victim of Charles Starkweather as her grandparents were. Without even being allowed a hearing, Carol's request was denied because the Nebraska Pardon Board is a bunch of jerks. But hopefully... This statement given by the Ward's granddaughter will serve as a little bit, at least, of the absolution that her tired soul so desperately needs. Liza said, My grandparents, as much as I know about them, were people of faith and integrity and grace, and they would have wanted the truth to be known. And this is the truth. Carol Fugate was not guilty. She was a victim of a system, an old boy's network, fueled by anger, pain, and the grief of the time. There was so much fear that people couldn't look at the situation objectively. Amen, sister! And that is the story of Lansing local Carol Ann Fugate, the true crime legend in our own backyard. Like, literally, she worked in my backyard. How crazy is that? Thank you for coming to my dead talk. Some of my sources for this week's episode were... The book, The Twelfth Victim, by Linda Battisti and John Stevens Berry. The Conspirators Podcast. I just said something wrong. I say so many things wrong, I don't even know what anymore. Um, The Conspirators Podcast, episode 34, and several articles from the Lincoln Journal Star in Nebraska. They love them, some stark weather stories. You can find a full list of sources on the page for this episode on the So Dead website, because there were a lot of them. Uh, it is it is hard to research a story when there's not a lot of information out there, but sometimes it's even harder when there's too much information. And there is so much on this case. It was really kind of hard to parse through it all in any kind of efficient manner and get the parts that, you know, were, were important and vital and would make a good story. And here I'm just going to give you the, the high-level stuff so you kind of know what I'm working with. But I, I think you guys know a lot of this. Um, Stephen King kept a scrapbook on the Starkweather murders. That's how twisted this whole case is. Several movies have been made about or inspired by the case, including Natural Born Killers with Woody Harrelson and Juliette Lewis. Hated it. California with Brad Pitt and Juliette Lewis again. Hated it a little bit less. Um, Badlands with Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek. Super boring. My fa- <laughs> my favorite was actually, I'm such a 90s child. My favorite version of this story is the 1993 miniseries Murder in the Heartland with Tim Roth and Firuza Balk. Because first of all, I love Firuza Balk. And second of all, I love, 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 love 1990s made-for-TV movies and miniseries. I love them. One of my favorite... Favorite? I can't... (laughs) I can't even talk. One of my favorite movies of all time is... And I'm not even just talking about made-for-TV movies. I'm talking about, like, movie movies. One of my favorite movies is the horribly inaccurate, ridiculously cheesy... Bonnie and Clyde, The True Story, which was a miniseries made in the 90s. There have been books and songs about the Starkweather murders. Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska was written about Charlie and Carol Ann. I mean, this this was a big piece of American true crime history. And the final chapter takes place right here in little old Michigan. 
All right. So it is time for me to answer a listener question, which is something I haven't done in like a really long time. Um, this one comes from Banana Booty on Twitter. That <laughs> That is a fabulous Twitter handle. And no, you guys can't have it because she's already got it. Banana Booty asks, what is your favorite piece of clothing to wear? Where do you get your favorite tacos? I thought this was a good one to answer right now because what else do we have to talk about in the midst of a pandemic besides food and what we lounge around in? I'll tell you what I love is not having to wear a bra all the time because I never leave my house. That's amazing. But yeah, I spend most of my time in big loose t-shirts and yoga pants right now because ain't nobody going to see me. And yeah, comfort comfort if nothing else and there really is nothing else these days uh, my favorite tacos it depends on my mood I would have to say first of all let me let me just state this tomatoes are disgusting I hate them I can't I can't um, so that's a struggle for me with tacos and then cilantro tastes like soap it's awful I hate it I'm sorry if that offends you it's a genetic thing. I don't know if we've talked about this before. We might have. Um, but I read that somewhere that the there's a gene that some people have that to them, cilantro tastes like soap. And I am one of those people and I hate it and I think it's disgusting. Um, so authentic like taco tacos, not for me. So Famous Taco is a local, local taco. Jo- I can't even say taco today, you guys. I am exhausted. I'm sorry. <laughs> Famous Taco in Lansing is one of my favorite, but I like their roast beef. I don't know if they call them roast beef or shredded beef. Those are my favorite. They're roast beef or shredded beef tacos with sour cream. Love them. If not Famous Taco, then El Azteco. I love El Azteco's tacos. (laughs) That sounded funny. Um, I love their tacos. I love their cheese dip, only when it's not too spicy. Sometimes it's too spicy. They've got this like cottage cheese I miss it. I miss the world, guys. I know you feel me on that. Yeah, so grungy clothes and gross, greasy tacos. That's that's my life. What else can we talk about before we go? Um, the Festival of Oddities. Oh my god, it's only a few weeks away. Again, festival is the wrong word for it this year. I'm just not changing the name because this is something that's going to move forward and and happen and be a yearly thing. We've got an amazing venue, an amazing crew, um, both my team that that helps me and then the crew at the museum. Julie, if you're listening, you rock. They're so cool and it's it's going to be fun this year and it's going to be cool this year, but obviously there are some challenges with keeping the crowd levels down and keeping everyone apart. And, you know, we got to wear the masks, which are so fucking uncomfortable, but we're still doing it. So if you're in the area, it's in Charlotte, September 5th, 11 to 7, masks required, social distancing required. Don't come and be a jerk. We're not, we're not, we're, we're following the rules and we're trying to keep everybody safe while still having a good time. And, supporting local businesses. The Serial Killer Chronicles, I know we've talked about it before. That's long since over and just a piece of my memory now. Um, But all eight episodes, if you haven't listened, are available for streaming so you can kind of knock the whole thing out in a road trip even. Merch, so dead merch. Someone just sent me a picture of a magnificent what the fuck hoodie that she bought her daughter for her birthday and it's adorable I love it so much I don't the the t-shirts and the sweatshirts and things like that come from a third party so I don't get to see that before it goes out and a lot of times I don't see what it's going to look like until someone actually orders it so that's always fun to see but yeah on the so Dead website there's a merch tab tons of stuff that you can get patreon I know I did an individual shout out to all of my patrons last time it's just you know, now more than ever, Patreon is just a a godsend a lot of times because there's a lot of costs that you don't consider. I do this whole thing pretty low rent, but there's a lot of costs involved in this whole podcasting thing. So if you love So Dead and you've got, you know, a couple bucks to throw at it a month to help support, I would appreciate it so much. And there's lots of cool, lots of cool benefits, a monthly bonus episode, 
I say episode like the most Michigan person on the planet. Sorry. Um, monthly bonus episodes, giveaways. You're always the first to know big news that's going on. I always share there first. So lots of stuff. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you guys for joining me today. And please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and YouTube at So Dead Podcast. Again, please check out the Patreon page for ways to support the show financially, which you can find that at patreon.com forward slash so dead podcast. And be sure to visit so deadpodcast.com for all your so dead merch. As always, you can email me your feedback and story ideas to so deadpodcast at gmail.com. A new episode is coming your way in a couple of weeks. Until then, keep shining, you magnificent what the fucks. 